Good evening. This is a very, very unique uh, broadcast of this evening at Hromatsky. You rarely have high-level Ukrainian politician with a foreign politician and experts speaking and discussing uh, the essence of the way the countries are run. So uh, we just watched this Swiss movie. It's a special project uh, Hromatsky makes with the uh, Swiss embassy here to show you a bit how the democracy works. But in the studio, we would have now very informal and interesting discussion with a, a unique group of people. Uh, so we have here Olha Evazovska, who is head of uh, the probably uh, most important Ukrainian uh, watchdog on the parliament, Opora. And uh, Krista Makwalder is the president of the Swiss National Parliament, uh, the parliament which is one of the oldest in the world, Oksana Seroid, who is the vice speaker of the Ukrainian parliament, and Mary O'Hagan, who is the director of National Democratic Institute in Ukraine, but has incredible background in working in the Balkans, Georgia, Russia, and Africa, and the UK, and numbers of countries. Um, so uh, why we're here, we would like really to understand and to share this knowledge, to understand what's working, of course, here, not in Ukraine by this stage, what is the price of compromise. So probably, um, you know, as we have your as a, um, honorary guest, uh, Krista, we would ask, you know, uh, how really this we just watched the movie, but the price of compromise in Switzerland, we always think that it's, you know, like it's well-established country, people are very polite, very well organized, so probably it's all uh, going very easy. Uh, is it really like that? Aren't there the fights and the other things? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. And of course, in Switzerland, uh, we do not have uh, easy-going politics. So we also have our uh, political debates, which can be rather harsh. And as you have seen in the movie, there are also um, political positions differing um, much uh, for, from each other. But we have a, maybe a special system with working with changing majorities in parliament so we don't have a coalition government and the parliament to follow the parliament's majority while our ally from today is our uh, enemy from political enemy from tomorrow but we have to be friendly to each other and we have to find compromises and this is uh, of course a learning from the swiss political system compromises are to be considered to be typical Swiss because we always have also to include our language minorities. We have a, a lot of variety living in Switzerland and that's why compromises are extremely important and they are not easy to obtain. And Oksana, I think for us the compromise is sometimes uh, that people are voting for the good reason, but sometimes violating the, the procedure, as for instance we know this way that people vote uh, for the other SMPs in order to, to reach either these uh, constitutional amendments or some anti-discrimination law. So what is the uh, price for a compromise you have paid? Um. It's also a very difficult question because um, the, the current parliament is already the, uh, the story, yes? And it's, uh, uh, it had its previous story and the previous legacy. And when we, I personally came to uh, parliament, which was one, less than two years ago, I believe that it's so easy and that it's so obvious when you have the rules of procedures, you just step in, you adhere to those rules of procedures and everything will be working. Unfortunately, people first that used to um, practice different rules and procedure not written and maybe not uh, appropriate very often. For them, it, is, uh, it was um, no sense to change them, like not to adhere to the normal rules and procedure. Uh, and um, at that time, you understand that, um, yes, yes, you'd have to compromise, unfortunately. Uh, even though probably I'm, sometimes I feel that I'm the only one who is uh, trying to raise this voice that we have the rules and procedures and we have to adhere to them. But I think what is even more important that uh, to distinguish the, the compromise and between the, the, the compromise and the deal or the compromise or consensus and the deal. Because when you, uh, the compromise means that everybody wants to achieve the same goal. But the deal uh, is when uh, 
uh, somebody has the goal and everybody has to adhere to this goal. So, um, and my biggest problem or my biggest challenge is not the compromise um, in the, like in a good sense, in the pure sense of this world, but the deal. So when somebody has made a decision and just come to you and say, this is the deal you have to follow. <laughs> Oksana, your organization is really following and, you know, keeping the uh, members of parliament accountable. So really, uh, do you see that there is this sometimes compromise for good uh, made by violating the procedures or some other issues should be raised and uh, maybe somehow fixed? I think that in Ukrainian framework or in Ukrainian situation, the world of compromise has a bad, bad background. You know, because uh, democracy is a procedure and rules too. It's not only good decisions and, I don't know, hearing from society some ideas and so on and so forth. That's why I think that compromise uh, is not enough as a reason or uh, to make some deals. Uh, and if you are talking about decision-making process, rules is very important too, uh, because it's a framework um, from different bad guys and different bad ideas to uh, adopt something uh, because of war, because of political crisis, uh, because of corruption, but not, uh, not openly. You know, that's why I, I'm, I think that we have a good progress in Ukrainian parliament. If you try to compare this parliament and previous one or two uh, previous uh, session and so on and so forth. But I think that if uh, our parliament uh, has the rule to adopt laws, they should be um, more open to do uh, not deals but to work according to the law too and they can broke this law and mary you worked in different tur turbulent places yes. where it's very hard to reach something so uh what is way out you know you can give the examples but i think like can you really make people to <laughs> to do the compromises in in that way i i think all politics is about interests of one sort or another um, and when it comes to consensus building. I prefer the term consensus building to compromise because compromise could cover a whole range of different things. But consensus building in the sense I mean it is any mechanism that enables parties with different points of view to reach agreement on an issue of national interest. Uh, and one of the biggest dangers uh, in uh, fragile or emerging democracies is that politics becomes so polarized that nobody uh, can give any ground and reach agreements in the national interest and sometimes that can uh, be very damaging to the state itself and to the population. Uh, so I think one of the things that's so marvelous about the Swiss tradition is that you have deeply embedded culture of building compromises and consensus. And that's partly because of the way the whole political process works. You can't move without it. But even in systems where it's not uh, mandated, where it's not a necessary thing because of the way the system works, it's still very beneficial, especially when you're looking at policies, the impact of which will li live way beyond the lifetime of one parliament. So things like pensions. And um, so there is some video I'd like to show, and it's about the new parliament. Uh, the recent ones, uh, we call it pushing the buttons, uh, the uh -huh. people who do that, but please, uh, you can show how sometimes the good laws are voted.
As the uh, president of the National Council in Switzerland, how do you see that? Well, it's obviously not a good example of good parliamentary governance because, of course, every MP is elected to represent its constituents and the people, and of course, everybody has a vote. But uh, you should ever, never ever vote for your neighbours who are not present. But we have also or had examples in Switzerland, uh, not that many and not <laughs> <laughs> to this extent, but once uh, because we are sitting rather uh, next to each other and very narrow. And so uh, once an MP voted also for his neighbor who wasn't present. And then we introduced a second button. So you first have to push the first button before you can vote. So you used to your both of your hands, and that's why you can eliminate all those who want to vote for their neighbours who are not present as well. Okay. Oksana, I it's a very practical <laughs> solution. Yes. But Oksana, of course it could be done, but still, you know, like you have all these new MPs, and there are some of them, those who like committed to the good discipline, the revolution, but they still doing like that. And uh, never there are the cases that these laws are considered, you know, taken back, they still are enforced. Those who were committed, they don't do this. Um, the, the newcomers do. But those mainly who bought their their uh, constituencies uh, for money, uh, they, they practice this quite often. But I think the, uh, in Ukraine there are a couple of um, things that actually um, have framed this. Yes, first of all, we have the we have to these uh, requirements that we have to have the 226 votes for any decision, which is the constituents, uh, not constituents, but the majority in the parliament. Not majority of the present, but majority of all, which is very difficult in principle. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, we don't have the culture to talk in parliament. So in principle, the, uh, the voting for another person, this is the lack of uh, culture of consensus building. because. The people were used, the decisions were made not right. in the parliament, but in other places. And third problem is, of course, the really fast track of uh, decision making. Uh, the decision should be cooked in the proper manner, the specific stages. If it's not cooked properly, then it will be raped yeah. like this. Yeah. Um, Olha, you know, we can laugh always. Uh, people love, journalists laugh when they see it, but these are the serious things. Are they, or how would you explain that? Why it matters? It doesn't. I think it's very serious uh, problem for Ukrainian parliament because we remember, all of us remember this case from 16th of January in 2014. And this is a part of that story is that it's not solution for discipline problem in parliament because sometimes we, uh, we will have a problem uh, when parliament will adopt something uh, against constitution, against rule of law, against human rights and something like that because of this normal situation in parliament. That's why we should stop it as a practice and uh, all parliamentarians, all MPs must understand that uh, it's their job to be in a uh, plenary session during uh, during parliament meeting. And uh, Mary, how it happens in the other countries? Is it really the bigger thing you can tell? Like why you talk about this? This thing? experience is, is certainly not unique to Ukraine. Uh, there are other places where what's often referred to as piano voting takes place. Uh, it's usually in a situation where, um, first of all, the members of the House have not got to the point of defending the reputation of Parliament. They don't see the reputation of Parliament as belonging to them, uh, and therefore they don't see the connection between how they conduct themselves and how the institution is perceived externally. But that is something that does change over time. It also has to do with the way they see their own role. If they have more ownership of the decisions that their factions take, then they take the voting more seriously. And one topic more I'd like to discuss, it's like this uh, party discipline versus the individual um, 
the individual responsibility. How is there in Switzerland? You know, because sometimes the um, I, I'll give uh, so far. Uh, you know, like maybe you would explain how it is us, and I later give an example how we have do it here. Okay. Maybe you, you got some of the impressions out of the movies when you saw how, uh, how complicated is it, it is to convince every individual member of parliament for a certain topic, which was, by the way, a complicated one. Always when you have to regulate science issues, it's not so obvious as, as every, everyone has the, also uh, the scientific background. But still, we have uh, the guarantee by our constitution to vote in to with a complete freedom without any instruction but of course you have also uh, the commitment to your political party that's why the political parties have an interest that their members of parliament are not completely divided because mm -hmm. you want to put your political weight into yeah. the same yeah. uh, pot and not just uh, divide mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. but there are a lot of issues that you haven't closed votes by the political parties and you know that there are sensibilities that are backgrounds that are professional background or, or personal convictions which lead to a different vote that than the majority of the party uh, before I go I just like to give an example that a year ago um, your party Oksana Samopovic has excluded five MPs yes. who had voted in the first reading amendments to the Constitution there are um, I could definitely name name them but it was not the first time uh, you probably can also see uh, the Speaker of the Parliament how he kind of named these people. According to the records of the meeting of the Samopomish deputy faction of August 31st, 2015, I am informing you about the exclusion of Anna Gopko, Ostap Jednak, Pavlo Kishkar, Viktor Krevenko and Viktoria Ptashnik from the Samopomich deputy faction, signed by Oleg Berezyuk. Thank you. Um, so there were five, that, that's just one of the case, but Oksana, how you really uh, would say that, you know, the party is so strict and the people who were excluded, like Hanna Hopko and Viktoria Ptashnik, they are all these new hopes of the Ukrainian new parliament, well-respected, well-known. Um, the explanation is very easy. Uh, the, the party is uh, new and it was kind of a risk and everybody... Uh, actually committed to this risk when we came to parliament, that we didn't know each other well, but uh, we assumed that we are standing on the same uh, values. And uh, the, there were only four party members at that moment when the, the faction, the party group has been uh, convened in the parliament. And I met some of my faction colleagues only in the parliament. That was also true. because. This was because of Maidan, because we were trying to get this chance to be in politics. And uh, it appeared at the time that not all the people actually are ready to commit to those values. And uh, when we got the evidences that those people are actually involved in the political corruption, so it was the major reason... Maybe political corruption. Uh, it was not... Um, they had other obligations, I would say. I would put it this to way. To some other political forces? To some other political forces, to some other people. And it was the major reason. And for us, the, the constitutional amendments, it was kind of the, so, such a marker, as you, Christopher, mentioning, that it was a very crucial issue for us, for, for the political party, as for the identi identity. Because in a lot of other um, circumstances, of course, the, every... Uh, faction, every party member is free to vote. But amendments to the Constitution, this is something that is very crucial, and especially the amendments that were supposed to uh, provide for the special status of Donbass in the stage of war. So um, it was kind of the benchmark that we could not afford anymore, and it was a very tough decision uh, to exclude five uh, members from the party group. Well, I have something to respond. Um, yeah, I think it's a very difficult question from you. 
because it depends on electoral system. If we uh, elected this MP from single mandate district uh, without any political parties or with political parties, but uh, this MP has responsibility from their uh, citizens, their voters from this constituency, that's why uh, he can uh, or he or she can adopt any uh, bill uh, according to the will, political will from uh, from their voters, not from only from political parties. The second view, if, uh, for example, we have um, proportional uh, electoral system and these MPs uh, will vote against ideology of political parties or main uh, main position f um, in their program and their program as a political party, it's, it's a part of responsibility from this MPs uh, to the, uh, his or her political party. So that's why it's not so easy question, because it depends on the electoral system and a reason why this MPs will vote for this, uh, for this way. Is it corruption or is it uh, views from their voters and program and so on and so forth? Mary, but you're probably also following how it's going on. There is another, uh, like, we can give a number of cases. So, for instance, there are uh, maybe some MPs who are probably would be also more known outside of Ukraine as the young reformers, like Mustafa Nayem and Sergei Leshenko, mm -hmm. and they have uh, stood against more or less their president party, especially by voting against the general prosecutor, uh, accusing there uh, that there is a plot between the uh, oligarch groups, right. and uh, they are more or less would be also accused by the parties that, you know, like you can't leave, you go against your party yeah. the way that you come to the parliament. Uh, well, the first thing to say about that, I think, is that um, political parties in Ukraine, most of them are in a fairly early stage of formation. And during an early stage of party formation, uh, you're not likely to be able to achieve a very high degree of party cohesion. That's something that gets built over time. Uh, I think another thing to say is there's no consensus when it comes to international standards as to who owns an MP's mandate. In some yep. jurisdictions, the MP owns their own mandate. In other jurisdictions, it's basically owned by the party. So as Olga says, the electoral system also has something to say about this. I think in practical terms, the thing that helps the most to build um, a real sense of party identity and party cohesion is to have decision-making processes within the factions that are inclusive. Uh, the least disciplined factions are usually those where only one person gets to make a decision that everyone else is expected to follow it. But if you have serious discussion within factions and everyone has an appropriate say, it's easier for people to accept the majority's decision, even if they don't fully agree with it. And as far as I know, you have in the, um, in the, even the UK parliament, this kind of position of the person who is called wipe, you know, somebody who makes the uh, members whip, of yes, the party yes. to, to vote. But I also ask to ask Chris, how you do that? How do you, in per personally, how do you act? How you do the thing that the, all members of your party vote? Well, we also have our political fractions, mm. which means that we meet uh, first before the committees are meeting for a delegation meeting and we try to get a common sense how uh, to approach an issue or how to deal uh, with concrete proposals or a bill. Then we do have before the plenary session also meetings within our fraction, within our political party and there we have a very basic democratic uh, discussions, mm -hmm. we have votes mm -hmm. and there are also crucial issues that we declare some of the topics as strategic from a political Political standpoint right. from a right. political but point of view, and then we ask, we ask friendly <laughs> our colleagues <laughs> to vote uh, like uh, two thirds of the fraction it needs to declare an issue as right. a strategic. Right. But, but you're the head of the uh, national council today. But where you, have you ever voted um, in a way that your party agreed, but you didn't really, you know, you personally uh, didn't want to vote for this or that? Well, during this More. year, I don't have a vote. So, no, but, I, like but in your but career, in, in, during my career, it always depends on whether something is very important for me. So there are topics that uh, are less important for me or uh, are not um, against my personal conviction. So I can also once say, okay, I'm generous. I'm following my party because there are always arguments for mm. both sides. Mm. And uh, but there are also a lot of topics or a lot. Some 
some topics that I disagreed with my party and I declared it before. And you and voted it, and differently. I voted uh, uh, with my personal uh, conviction and so it was also accepted. And um, Oksana and Olha, is, if to be sure, is there something in our system that mo maybe doesn't work this way, that maybe this kind of uh, party discipline in this particular thing, in faction, isn't something good or vice versa. So how do you think, to be sure? As I already mentioned, the biggest problem is that um, in some cases the decisions are made not in parliament, not in the discussion in, in the faction uh, themselves. Uh, for example, in other faction all the decisions are taken uh, just on the meeting. So the, the faction sits, the faction discuss, and the decision is made. Uh, as far as I know, not, this is not the case in all faction. And this is the problem. The decisions, the parliamentary decisions has to be, have to be made in parliament. This is crucial. Just like to clarify, we understand that it's not a violation, but it's kind of the, this kind of uh, wide gap when, which, which could be used in a way for some of the... Uh, yeah, but Political I think reason. that the basic level for democracy and for good parliament is a level of political parties and fractions. Mm -hmm. If yeah. there is According no any the democratic the uh, institution or unofficial uh, rules inside the fraction, how to the make a deal, Anna how Depot, to, uh, I don't know, Lokishka, how is going on a uh, decision-making process Tashnik and so on and so forth, it's impossible to have uh, good practice inside the parliament. Uh, Generally, and uh, another side of the problem is corruption. Uh, it's not only about MPs; it's about fractions too. That's why there is a different situation when, for example, uh, I don't know, some MPs or a few MPs can be against the fraction because they know how, how the, this decision uh, was making without the fraction, without them, and uh, what is the price for this decision. That's why for Ukrainian practice uh, depends on when we are talking about discipline and decision-making process. So another topic is about how we play uh, according to the rules and how we can achieve that. So I also would like to, um, to add that within this uh, history of this uh, last Ukrainian uh, parliament, there were very few, if not if, if any, laws which were uh, voted fully according to all the procedures. But there is one special case. I'd also uh, would like to show the video. It was a very, uh, let's say, um, famous uh, law. Everybody's boasting. It's about anti-discrimination amendment. It's on our way for the European integration. And that's how it was done uh, with uh, our uh, for, uh, current prime minister and former head of the uh, Verkhovna Rada. There is a proposition to vote for a bill without any discussion. Friends, I offer forward a proposal again. Attention, I'll say it again. I ask you to back a bill without any discussion. Dear colleagues, dear members of parliament, first, please calm down. Concentrate. I ask you to consider the proposal number 34-42 in a second reading and in general according to a proposal from the team of contributors. Now a proposition will be introduced. According to the ad hoc procedure, it's what we are talking about, that we need to vote on a second reading and in general, this certain bill without any discussions as the team of the contributors proposed. Is it clear? Colleagues, please vote. Dear colleagues, we have 15 minutes break for consultations.
So within two minutes, uh, there were uh, for six times uh, when the law had to be put on vote, uh, which is not really the case as it should be. Uh, I know that there were things where it was even more times, but that was pretty unique within this very short period in time. Um, and how we do that? Can we really? And this law is still there. This is again the lack of consensus. This is the lack of proper procedure and the lack of discussion. Because very important issues, they have to be talked through. Though the MP, if, they, if this is about anti-discrimination, the MP had to have time to think about this, to go to their people, to check, to at least those who, who have good intents, to uh, explain their position. If it is not done properly, especially if government didn't talk, to anybody, neither to MPs nor to the to the uh, public. It was not explained at all. It was done overnight. Such decision that, that, uh, that if there is an attempt to make such a decision overnight, that will always destroy any consensus that would be even preliminary existing in the parliament. But Olga, we have this law. They are still there, and we live according to these laws voted in that way. I think it's a good case about last night's students' um, draft law, because usually um, Volodymyr Groisman said that it is a problem of our government because they didn't send us any draft laws, and we've got it uh, during last night. Olympics can uh, even uh, read it, and uh, this is the reason. But uh, we need to adopt this law because of IMF credit line or because of uh, EU association agreement uh, and something like that but you know um, this is uh, illness side of our parliament because if um, we had during this last year more than 5,000 draft laws in our parliament mm. and it's impossible to read all of them even read all of them that's why uh, our parliament should have a pro priorities agenda open agenda for MPs they should prepare a political dialogue process before mm. it mm. and what what is going on uh, what is uh, this law about and um, and so on. So, <laughs> good, yeah. maybe good objectives, but bad way to this objective. But uh, really, could that kind of things happen? And what you really do? Maybe you just don't have so many draft laws. Well, I would say this case couldn't happen in our parliament because we have very clear rules and procedures, but I can also say we are a long-term democracy and so there are rules in place for a long time. I would and just I add that in particular your position is existing since 1848, yes, 1848, so it's more than a um, century and a half. Exactly. But still, it is important, I think, the whole procedure, having clear timelines, because it's important for a parliament to being well prepared before you have the debates in the committees, before you have the debates in the plenary session. And of course, in today's world, it happens also in our parliament that the government just files something and say, it's, it's very important. So and you have you to do? be fast. So then it's always a critical one. As a, when we had this situation, we had the situation not during my uh, presidency, but uh, three years before, when we had to uh, push through or should push through a law allowing the United States of America having a special program for the Swiss banks, uh, which were accused by the U.S. Uh, for helping tax avoiders. And so the, the law was not accepted under this pressure by the parliament because the parliament resists of the pressure of the government, which is all, shows also a kind of uh, separating of they powers, and which is also maybe at the end of the, of the day risky because it can come out in a bad way. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the result was acceptable, and the result is good, but it was a risky way how to deal b between the two institutions, government and parliament. Mary, can you really enforce that like strict rules and procedures by papers or some other ways? If you speak about any other countries uh, with, mm. without that long history as Swiss, Switzerland uh, or the United well, Kingdom? Um, I mean, the first thing I'd like to say is, is that, yes, enforcement is possible. It requires political will. It requires a critical mass. Political will of whose political well, will? Not all 
members of parliament, but... No, it requires a critical mass of members to place a higher priority on the reputation and, and organisational culture of parliament as an institution. Uh, and under those circumstances, enforcement becomes possible, but it does take a bit of time. It takes several iterations. You have to gradually build up that sense that actually it's in everybody's interests for Parliament to have its own political identity. That does mm -hmm. take some time. And in the Ukrainian context, Ukraine has been in an emergency situation, dealing with external aggression, uh, economic crisis, and so on. And in those circumstances, it's understandable uh, that not every goal can be met right away. Uh, that's understandable. What I think is going to help Ukraine a lot, and this has already happened uh, in an agreement with the European Parliament, is that the goals have been agreed as to how Parliament should function in the future. And now there needs to be a process of gradually, step by step, working towards those goals. But it will take some time. Everyone has to be a little bit patient. And uh, we'd like also to discuss, you know, where is the difference between, let's say, the uh dialogue, agreement, and the deal, and sometimes uh, the deal which is done behind the closed doors. Because uh, we have a particular number of cases, because there is one deal when you say, like, you take position in this, I have this position on that law, uh, but sometimes we know there are the cases when, for instance, the parties agreed to vote for somebody if their person would be, I don't know, uh, promoted as the head of some another government body, uh, body or something like that. So, Oksana, to be very honest, in this late night discussion, uh, what kind of deals, you know, like, you know, like, you know, and you know, what is the difference, you know, the deals behind the clo do closed doors? I think that it's not a secret that the deals in Ukrainian parliament that are not real, and I feel kind of um, uh, awkward in this, uh, you know, in this place, because I'm the only one from Ukrainian parliament, and I have to take the, all the guilt, uh, and it's that, true. That's your position, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, but uh, what I would say, uh, uh, and, but this is all from the, or, the origin of, of the problem. Yeah, the immaturity comes from the lack of the culture of decision-making process. If the decisions, they are, as I mentioned, they are not taken in the parliament, they will be, the parliament will be from time to time, as I would say, raped to, uh, to, be, uh, to take the decision in this or that uh, on this on that matter and uh, the deal is part of this culture because if you do not respect the parliament as an institution uh, doesn't matter whether you sit in the parliament or you sit outside of the parliament whether it's government or the president it doesn't matter but if you do not respect the parliament as an institution it means that you will force the parliament to the deal, not to the consensus. And the deal, uh, it means that there is a personal interest behind that. And the consensus means that there is a common interest uh, behind this, the, the agreement. Yeah. And this is the difference. So if the decision, this is for what I learned already, being on my position and being in the number of the discussion, when there is a real intent to find the consensus, it is always doable. But when there is a real need to do the deal, uh, those who are not interested in the deal, they are just thrown away. You know, Oksana, is it, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Olha, is it um, really the case? And you are traveling to Minsk, uh, you are also talking um, um, on this, uh, you're participating in this process uh, which is taking place with the OSCE mediation, especially regarding this, uh, at this time, very politicized uh, and controversial uh, story on the elections on the territories which are probably under un un Ukrainian government control. And how do you see that? that there is like unpopular topic nobody really wants because it's like heavily politicized, parties don't want. Um, uh, and always complain. It's a deal, you know. No, I think it's a story about political dialogue too, and I want to push, uh, I don't know, Ukrainian side in Minsk and our president and our parliament to talk to each other about Minsk agreement and our way, how we will uh, will get our objectives in this process. It is a problem, and during this summer, uh, we organized a few meetings in parliament with uh, all political fractions, and do, do you know that 
not all of them visited these meetings. Just talk about what is going on inside Minsk, what is our uh, point of discussion, what is our position, and so on and so forth. That's why it's a problem, because politi uh, they have mostly political will to discuss in TV channel about this, but they don't want to talk about this truly, uh, eyes to eyes, you know, without any broadcasting, and it is a problem. And uh, I want to add one thing about uh, decision-making process. When you have a real decision-making process according to procedures, you will have a healthy child. Because it's like a pregnancy, you know? Mm. You can born a healthy child if you uh, didn't have the 38 or 40 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, this is the same story. A political dialogue is like a pregnancy. That's why in many parliaments in the world, it's like, I don't know, new child. They are working uh, uh, with this new bill or this uh, program or this reform during a long period because they need to find equality decisions inside these uh, new ideas which will be adopted like a bill. And it's not about our, our parliament now because, because there is no political will and uh, sometimes it's easily to have a deal um, What's in, in the in the closed offices, but not in Parliament, unfortunately. Um, but also, uh, before we go for that, that um, there was the, um, let's say, recommendation die, done by former uh, head of the European Parliament, yeah. Pat Cox, who is often travelling to Ukraine. So there were like more than uh, 52 recommendations, and number 11 was to, you know, to have this discussion before the voting that they are closed, that they are not yeah. for cameras, yeah. because you have a lot of like people speak on. Uh, oh, about their positions rather than they really want to do that. So how it's really uh, working in your case and how you see, is everything transparent or you don't show some of the things? Well, the committee meetings that was also shown in the film, they are behind closed doors. And there is one simple reason. Um, after having discussed a bill or a topic or an agreement, um, we have a transparent discussion and also reporters of the committee of the majority decision and of the minority um, to present it in the plenary session in Parliament. But in order that everybody can also move, can find a compromise, can find a solution, does not lose its face in this whole decision finding process, uh, that's why it's not a spectacle for the media, for the public scene. That's why these meetings are behind closed door, and I would say uh, it's, we have a good experience with that. But you said there are some people tweeting and doing their <laughs> social media. <laughs> well, I would say uh, tweeting uh, out of the committee meetings is, is not a, a real issue, but um, we had cases that uh, there were tweets out of the plenary session, which is uh, anyway streamlined, which is uh, very accessible for everyone who has a computer. Uh, but I mean, just to blame colleagues uh, on social media, this is not a good way to use Twitter or to use social media. You can use it to promote your political ideas or successes, that's, that's correct, and that's good, uh, or also to explain something, to give some background information, but not just to have a, a po po unpolitical debate, like a personal blaming. There is, uh, Mary, that I would be the first question to you. There, there was the um, pretty um, good interview this week done by the Ukrainian political analyst um, uh, Mikhail Minakov, and he more or less complains that, uh, of course, we inherited, uh, inherited uh, this legacy of the distrust uh, between the old political groups in order to build consensus, because there were always, you know, uh, people. There was always a place for treason right. in that case. But the young MPs are also very radical to show yeah. their principal thing, to show that they're, you know, like they wouldn't be the uh, not, not patriots or things like that. So how do you see? Are they really so radical? Well, one of the things that's very interesting uh, is that quite a number of the uh, people elected in 2014 who were new to politics, who came from civil society or the media, that they actually have shown the way on cross-party cooperation. Uh, they formed a cross-party caucus very early on. Uh, they have uh, very active discussions within that caucus. There are other 
cross-party formations uh, in the parliament as well that work very well, like the Equal Opportunities Caucus, uh, so, which, which is a mix of, of new MPs and those who've been elected before. So I think there really is the potential for cross-party cooperation in all of its many different forms, both formal and informal, uh, to take root in the Ukrainian parliament. I'm an optimist about this. Oksana, do you want to have more of the discussions behind the closed door without TV cameras? I just want to have more discussions in principle, <laughs> uh, because uh, this, is, uh, this is what is very much lacking in Ukrainian parliament, the culture of just talking uh, in, um, with the intent to find the consensus. Not talking, just talking, but to find the consensus of different issues. And uh, I think that we are, we are just learning. This is the first uh, parliament in Ukraine that is really practicing those practical talking on, f on the issues that need political consensus. Ola, do you have this high opinion as your organization is a watchdog? Um, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not agree with this uh, recommendation, but if you are talking about this Monday meeting with political fraction, it, it can be... Uh, under the closed doors, it's not a problem. But if you are talking about committee meeting and discussion, it should be, it must be open because of our uh, political context. And uh, it's not only uh, how I will, will look like without camera as a deputy, as MP. It's about decision making process. It's about arguments. It's about falsification of results of committee meetings and uh, adopted draft laws and so on and so forth. It's very important to show uh, most of the process, most of the process of uh, preparing draft. Uh, Chris, so we always think in Ukraine, and there are the reasons to that there are a lot of the like bureaucrats who are political. Uh, we have the issues when the general prosecutor, you know, taking the political stance on some of the issues. But you said you also have a bit of the cases with the political involvement of the general prosecutor, in particularly regarding yourself. Well, it happens, I think, in every. Uh, jurisdiction or even in every country that sometimes uh, competences are uh, sometimes used to a huge extent, I would say, once. And uh, of course, our justice is independent and uh, our general prosecutor should it as, be as well. But it seems also to be a political position because he is elected by the parliament. And that's also why it's in a way a position which has a political impact. And so uh, this position can also be used for political reasons. And um, the, to finalize, we already see also the change uh, in uh, globally that we have populists, the, the things which hadn't been accepted before uh, are accepted. If you go to, you know, like countries where the Ukrainian, either they are the Ukrainian uh, neighbors like Hungary or Slovakia, you have sometimes some far right figures, it would be unacceptable. There would be sometimes the hate speech uh, in the parliament. It would be also in some countries which we see that you know, exemplary like the Denmark or the Sweden. So, Mary, I would like to have this round to be very short. How do you see that and how we get out of that? Because people are elected. This is, yeah. a, you know, we have Donald Trump who says something mm -hmm. and he has public support. Yeah, yeah. Even, even more dramatic case in the Philippines, I think, where the current president has more than 90% support and uh, is clearly a populist. It is, it is a global trend and one that is born out of a big gap between people's expectations and their actual lives. And that can be exploited by uh, politicians in ways that are harmful. Uh, one has to hope that this is short-lived and that the lessons of history don't have to be learned again. Um, um, so, Chris, uh, um, you do have the question, like, immigration is currently in Europe, all over the place, the thing that there are talks which couldn't be you know, uh, accepted maybe three or four years ago, but now they are, they're getting popular, and the political center is going you know, to that direction. And so how you do that, what are the challenges, and what are your answers? Or don't you have this, or you don't have these troubles? Well, as we just have heard, I mean, populism is a, like a global phenomenon, but my big concern is that it affects also old and experienced democracies, such as the United States of America, such as Switzerland. We also see pop 
populist movements in our country, but we have a strong institutional system which is able, in a way, to deal with. But still, we have seen that some populist proposals raised by popular initiatives, which is a right of the citizens passed uh, regarding, for instance, immigration, just to limit immigration to Switzerland. And now we get a problem because we don't know how really to solve the problem because there are conflicting interests by uh, fulfilling our European obligations with the European Union, but also to um, have a, to respect the outcome of this popular vote. So populism is a phenomenon that we have also to address as elected members of parliament, that we have to demonstrate our respect to our voters, to their expectation, but we have also to be honest. We, don't, uh, we have to explain our politics, we have also to say what is possible and what isn't, yeah. and I think then you can have an honest, open dialogue with, yeah. with the voters yeah. and maybe uh, diminish a little bit the populism. So we are wrapping up, and if to be very short, Oksana, what would be your recipe? Like one short thing when you think we can really, you know, um, let's say confront this kind of the, uh, rising the level of tension and it's, this, the, in the parliament then, people fight. Uh, with regard to the populism, this is very simple. This is the general challenge of the world. The, the, the world uh, facing global challenges and people are looking for the simple decisions. What do we do in Ukraine? We, not, just not to be lazy and to, to be honest, talk to people, tell the truth, even though it's very, very hard talk. But in principle, if you are honest, if you go down to, to the to the village, to the town, to the community, and if you talk, people are able to hear. And this is what I know for good. I think that the answer is very easy. It's strong state and check and balance system. Because in those countries where the state system is very strong, even a big number of populace in parliament doesn't matter, really. Okay, so for that, I'd like really to thank for this uh, incredible and unique pretty discussion, but we have our own postscriptum, because Ukrainian audience voting, uh, Christy, you are guest, so we really would like to know, you know, what are the expenses of the uh, president of the National Council? How much benefits do you have? So that would be something everybody is very curious, so we would say is our postscriptum of the program. How many ADs? Cars and all the things you have. <laughs> well, um, we are a parliament without uh, big privileges, which means we have no drivers, we have a general ticket for the train, we have no individual staffers, we get just a credit for engaging a student and uh, having our own laptop, and we don't have pensions when we retired or are not uh, re-elected, but we get some contribution to our private pension plan. So we are actually a you are cheap, but you are working. And we are working, exactly. We are not full-time members of parliament that uh, we have always to underline. We have also our proper job, but we are actually a cheap parliament, but I would also say rather efficient parliament. So, okay, thanks again for everybody, and I really hope you've enjoyed this discussion. <laughs>